All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some acceleration and distance practice problems here. So I did write three equations that we have for this unit up above here. Uh, realistically, we're not going to be using this first equation at all, um, at least not for a lot, not for this particular practice sheet, just because there is no acceleration associated with it. Right? In order for us to be able to use formulas, the formulas have to um, aligned with what's actually happening in the, in the physical world. Um, so if we've got acceleration that's happening, I've got to make sure that I've got a, a formula that deals with acceleration, and this first one doesn't. So it's just not a good choice for, for this particular page, but I did want to at least write it down to show that it is another option that we have throughout this unit, because eventually we want to get to the point where we can decide between these three uh, without just knowing that, oh, it happens to be that we're you know, practicing acceleration, so we've got to go with an acceleration problem. Uh, we do want to be able to pick them out on our own. So let's take a look at this first problem. I know we did this in class, but I think it um, bears bears repeating. Or if you weren't in class, hopefully you'll get a good um, sense of of what we what we did. All right. So number one, we've got this hot air balloon. It's being released from rest, and it attains a velocity of six meters per second. So we actually found out a couple of numbers right there. Uh, it's being released from rest. So that tells us that initially it was on the ground. Um, and initially it was not moving, it was going zero meters per second. And attains a velocity of just means that we are getting to a point where it eventually gets up to six meters per second. In other words, that is our final velocity. All right. All right, so for part A here, it tells us that this balloon has an acceleration of 1.7 meters per second squared, which makes sense that it's positive because it is it is rising, it is going upwards. Um, and we want to know how long it took to attain this velocity of six meters per second. And it just repeats what we already knew from up above, that that is our, our final velocity, or at least that's the velocity that we're interested in. It might be getting faster and faster and faster even after this, but we're concerned with six meters per second. That is our, our final that we're dealing with. It's the final velocity that I care about. Right, so it may be helpful, actually I would recommend in, in pretty much all cases to diagram it out. So my flat line there represents the ground. And then I'm going to draw a horrible picture of a hot air balloon. Actually, that's not bad for me. I'm actually very impressed. For just about everybody else, it's probably terrible. But um, we know that this hot air balloon is rising. Right increasing again the beauty of notability and straightening lines for us it's awesome uh, and we know that this hot air balloon is getting faster and faster because it's accelerating so to begin with it doesn't really move that great of a distance within our first time period then it starts to move a, a greater distance within our next time period and then after that it moves an even greater distance and in our final time period here it would be going faster and faster and faster. So we're increasing the amount of distance that we're covering each second. Remember when we do diagram these things out, these hash marks or these ticks here, they represent a time interval and a consistent time interval. So this first time increment would be one second, one second, one second, or it could be you know, uh, two seconds in each case, an hour in each case, as long as we know that it's a consistent time incre increment or time interval from one hash mark to the next, we know that we're in good shape diagramming this out. All right, so let's see. We want to figure out what, um, well, we know that the balloon has this acceleration. We want to know how long did it take to attain the, um, the velocity. So how long could be distance or time, but then when we start putting did it take into the picture here, then we know that we're dealing with a, a time that, that I'm looking at here. Um, so there's a few formulas that I could potentially use. The formula that we'll use in, in this case happens to be this first one that we're pretty accustomed to by this point, especially if you saw the last video. Uh, we used it used it quite a bit. The reason that it is going to be the second formula here, or the first acceleration um, formula in general, second one, of course, how, how I have it written here, um, is because I know a final velocity, 6 meters per second, and I don't deal with a final velocity in any of these other other problems so it actually narrows it down right there for me another way that we could look at it is say well I've got my acceleration so that narrows it down to this formula or this formula it doesn't help me out more than that um, but then I don't know my displacement I don't know how much distance this hot air balloon was able to rise so it doesn't make sense to go with 
that formula so it does narrow it down in a couple of different ways to the formula that we've been using so I'm gonna fly through this one because we did a lot of practice with it already um, if you need to slow it down obviously slow down the, the video though so my final velocity is 6 my initial velocity um, it was released from rest 0 my acceleration was 1.7 from above there and my time, oh, I don't know. How long did it take to attain that velocity? So in the end, I end up with 6 equals 1.7 times t. Um, now again, just a point to talk about real, real quickly here. Uh, when you are solving for your variable, make sure you're not looking at this as, you know, do I multiply 6 by 1.7 or do I divide 1.7 by 6 or 6 by 1.7? I mean, even talking that way, it sounds confusing so of course going back to, to solve for that would be a really uh, big point of confusion so we just care about this part uh, we don't care about the six at all it's just some number um, over here though I gotta get t by itself so let's divide by 1.7 since it's currently being multiplied by by um, 1.7 so do the opposite then of course if I do it to one side I've got to do it to the other so then I would actually of course become uh, aware need to become aware what this number is at that point uh, and hopefully you already have a number in your head for me I know that 6 divided by 2 if this was 2 would be 3 I know that 6 divided by 1 and a half is 4 therefore I know my my final answer here is going to be somewhere between 3 and 4 uh, which if you do go to plug it in your calculator you do come up with 3.53 seconds so we know that we're in, in pretty good shape and again you, you really want to get in the habit of doing that first of all because you got the SAT coming up even though it sucks uh, there is a non-calculator portion of it and you have to have some decent number sense to get through that and secondly even more importantly than just some dumb test is that um, you know have people that have decent number sense um, are people that are less less often you know screwed over in business transactions uh, maybe even going to buy a house one day you know just having an idea of what a, a single percentage or a little bit of a decimal point could actually mean it could mean a, a difference in in many many things uh, but that's another discussion for another time I suppose but number sense is really 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 important all right so second part here it asks us for how high did the hot air balloon travel in that time so that time is the time that we just figured out here so it's weird because I don't have any formulas that deal with height directly but actually I do kind of right because if I think about what height is height can be measured in meters and really all height is is it's a distance but rather than a horizontal distance going side to side it's just simply a distance up and that's exactly what I am going to be solving for here how high did this thing get We'll just call that D. All right. Um, so I know that I'm going to be dealing with this new formula. And actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this room over here for this particular problem just because I know that I'm going to run out of room really quickly over here. So I always like to write out the formula, and I hope you will get in the habit of writing out the formula every single time even though it can be a little bit of a pain it does believe it or not save time in the end because you're not constantly going back and forth up to here and into the problem you've just got the formula right there you can throw the numbers below even though it takes another extra couple of seconds to write it out you will end up saving time in the long run I promise so we know our initial velocity it was released from rest this is still part of problem one the second section here so zero meters per second to begin with my time we get solved for. It's going to take 3.53 seconds to get up to its final velocity, which just so happens to be its its highest height as well. This one half and the squared comes from how we derive this formula or how we actually get this formula from graphs. I'm not going to really get into that, but if you are interested in it, know that there's an optional video on day eight of Schoology it's at Khan Academy that helps you helps you figure out how we actually get this formula so if you're somebody that really needs to know in order to feel comfortable with it please go ahead and watch that um, but if you're not quite comfortable with the math yet I would leave that leave that one alone for now we know our acceleration is 1.7 and we know our time it's the same time that we used over here 
and that is squared. All right, so there's a lot of times, and you'll find this trick as you as you go along, to be useful. That our initial velocity is going to be zero, and zero times whatever our time is. It doesn't matter if it's 3.53, a billion, or a half. Uh, we're going to end up with zero in the end. So you can just sort of cross off that first part of the formula. Uh, if that kind of freaks you out to just cross off part of a formula, then go ahead and put zero in and put your time in, and the math will work itself out for you. So usually I do not look at this as one big problem, and, and most people would not look at this as one big problem. It's more like, well, what's zero times 3.53? That'd be zero. Then we could look at it as what's a half of 1.7 which would be 0.85 and then finally what's 3.53 squared and I don't know that off the top of my head but what I do know is 3 squared is 9 and 4 squared is 16 so when I go to plug this into my calculator put 3.53 squared in I got 12.46 and that's really reasonable because again I should be somewhere between 3 squared and 4 squared or in other words somewhere between 9 and 16 and 12.46 absolutely fits that bill alright so now I can continue on here uh, I don't have to continue to include this zero uh, because when I add it to whatever is going on back here it's not going to change anything um, 0.85 times 12.46 it gives me a total of 10.59 so 10.59 meters so in other words how high did the hot air balloon travel in that time well it traveled 10.59 meters meters make sense because it is a it is a height it's, we could absolutely measure in meters if I came out with like meters per second or seconds then I would know like well I don't measure height in seconds and I don't measure height in meters per second so I would have to go back and and check something there but this 10.59 seems to be very very reasonable all right and of course we could always go back and and plug it in um, plug it in for D and solve for T or solve for V or solve for A and if I am solving for let's say A for example then I should come out with 1.7 since that's what the acceleration in the problem is if I'm solving for you know, my initial velocity I should come out with zero because that's what's in this in the um, in the problem to begin with all right, so let's take, go ahead and take a look at number two here. We've got this plane that's flying at a speed of 120 meters per second. It's being accelerated uniformly um, at a rate of, grabbing another color here, sorry, um, at a rate of nine meters per second squared. Accelerated uniformly just simply means that it is accelerating at that rate and uniformly is just it's a nice even acceleration so it's not like this jerky motion it just go it's increasing speed more and more and more as time goes on nice and evenly all right so the plane is flying at a speed of 120 meters per second so that's actually its initial velocity because that's how fast it's going to begin with no it's a velocity because of the the meters per second and again we can have a little unit chart associated with variables if um, if that helps at all my unit of meters per second is going to tell me that I am using a variable of V or velocity uh, meters per second squared would tell me that I am dealing with an acceleration meters and second hopefully we're familiar with meters would of course be distance and seconds would be time so that might help if you are ever confused as to you know, what these variables mean or what variable I'm actually supposed to plug numbers in for. Let the units work for you rather than being something that's you know annoying that you ended up losing points for on a test or a quiz or something like that. Let it be meaningful to you and, and use them to your advantage to know exactly what variable you're plugging, plugging these numbers into. Um, and it was accelerated at this rate of 9 meters per second squared. So 9 meters per second squared. Again, that meters per second squared would tell us that we are dealing with an acceleration. All right, we want to know the speed at the end of 4.5 seconds. Um, so at the end of 4.5 seconds would tell me that I'm looking for a final velocity. So I'm not really sure what that, what that velocity is. We're going to solve for that. And of course, 4.5 4. 4. seconds would be a time. 
So if we did have the, you know, the formulas next to us here, one of the formulas we know is uh, final velocity equals an initial velocity plus acceleration times time. And the other formula that we've been dealing with or will be dealing with here is displacement or distance equals our initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared. And again, if you uh, really want to know where that one half and where that squared comes from, watch the optional video in day eight of Schoology. All right, so uh, which formula to use here? Well, I'm looking for the plane's final speed. I can only deal with final speed in this in this formula here. Uh, my displacement formula deals with velocity, but it's specifically an initial velocity, and we're looking for a final. So this one is not going to work for this problem, All right? And hopefully you're pretty familiar with how to use this one by this point. Uh, we've used it quite a quite a bit over the course of these past few um, few days here. I'm looking for the final velocity. Plane was flying at the speed of 120. Many times the initial velocity, you know, we're starting from rest is zero. So in this case, we actually do have a non-zero initial velocity, which is super exciting, I'm sure. Uh, we know our acceleration and we know our time. So go ahead and solve that out. Of course, look at your order of operations. Nine times four would give me 36. Nine times five would give me 45. So I know that the second part of this problem is somewhere between 36 and 45. Um, plug it into my calculator, 9 times 4.5 gives me 40.5, which makes absolute sense. And of course we've got this 120 that we didn't deal with quite yet. So after I add 120 to 40.6, I get 160.5 meters per second, because it is a velocity that I'm dealing with, so meters per second would of course be the unit for velocity. And we would want to know, does this make sense? Well, we were going 120 meters per second to begin with. It's accelerating, and it's accelerating for you know almost five-ish seconds. So it should make sense that we are, are increasing our speed. Well, 160.5 is definitely larger than 120. It's not dramatically larger. So it seems like this is very reasonable. We've only been accelerating for you know four and a half seconds. Um, so we shouldn't expect to see a giant, giant jump. You know, if we ended up with you know, 1,605 because we forgot the decimal, hopefully that would jump out at us as like, okay, that's way too, way too fast given that it's only accelerating for four and a half seconds. So use what you know about real life scenarios when going through and trying to figure out if your answer is reasonable or not. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the distance traveled. Um, I am going to give myself a little bit more space here. So we're going to do the, do the problem over, over here um, just so that we don't run out of room. All right, so since it's looking for the distance that it's traveled, I'm going to use a formula that deals with distance. More technically, this formula deals with displacement, but we can absolutely use it because really this isn't talking about distance. It's more talking how much displacement does this object have. Sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, even though it's not technically correct. It's sort of like it's just easier to talk that way. It's sort of like astronomers using the, the term or using the phrase that the sun rises and sets when we of course know that it, it's actually the Earth's rotation that is causing it to appear as though the sun is rising and setting, but it's just much easier to say rising and setting. So in this case, it's just easier to talk about distance rather than saying the displacement, but realize that it really is technically displacement. So what uh, displacement or what distance did it travel? Well, I don't know my distance, but I do know that this actually does have an initial velocity that is not zero. So I can't just cross off the first part of that problem. Um, I actually am going to have a number that is not zero. Um, I know that it's traveling for four and a half seconds. Again, if you're interested in where we get the half and the squared from, watch the optional video in day eight of Schoology. Uh, my acceleration is nine meters per second squared. And my time is always going to be the same. Whatever time I had to begin with, I'm going to have the same time to end with. Because really how this formula works, I know we've talked about it before, but how this formula works is the first part of the formula deals with how much distance or how much displacement we would have, assuming that we weren't accelerating. 
second part of the formula deals with when we are accelerating so we have to know well, if I had an initial velocity to begin with before I was accelerating I've got to take into account how much distance I would have been going and then I need to add on how much distance I would actually pick up from the acceleration so that's why we get this formula to at least to some degree and then of course we could go through and, and solve this out um, I end up with 120 times four and a half giving me 540 I know that's reasonable because 120 times 4 would give me around 480 um, so this is and 120 times 5 would give me around 600 so you know, this is between 480 and 600 so I know I'm in good shape uh, the second part of this problem here we could say four and a half four and a half squared gives me 20 point two five which again very reasonable four squared would give me 16 five squared would be give me 25 so I'm somewhere between 16 and 25 so I know I'm good half of nine would be able to say is four and a half all right from there let's continue to solve this out it's four and a half times 20 and a quarter come out with 91 point one two five or one three however you want to round that off so I end in in the end it's just 540 plus this 91.125 or point one three depending on how you round that which ends up being six hundred and thirty one point one or point one three or point one two five meters and that's a very reasonable answer um, you know, I'm traveling for four and a half seconds, going 120 to begin with, so I'm going to cover a lot of distance. Plus, on top of it, I'm accelerating, so I'm going to cover a little bit more distance after that. So 600, uh, around 600 would be a really reasonable answer. I get 631.13, so I know I'm good to go. All right, let's take a look at number three here. We've got this engineer that's designing a runway to accommodate planes. Um, that gain a, a speed of 60 meters per second or need to gain a speed of 60 meters per second before they can take off. Uh, the planes are capable of being accelerated uniformly at one and a half meters per second squared. So realize that these physics formulas that we're dealing with, you know, they're not just formulas that are, you know, fun to play around with in a high school physics class to kill time. Like these are actually formulas that would be used in the real world, so to speak. Um, there would, of course, be many other formulas on top of this that an, an engineer would be using, especially to design a, a runway, but this would at least get us in the ballpark of um, sort of thinking about how long something would need to be before we take into account friction and all sorts of other forces that these planes are going to be experiencing as well. Um, so we want to know what's the expected time to take off, assuming that this plane is starting at rest, and we need to know the, the minimum runway length. All right, so expected time to take off. That means that I'm either going to be dealing with uh, one, one of the two formulas. I can't really narrow it down based on time alone because, of course, both my formulas for acceleration deal with time. Let me add this one in here. Uh, so that doesn't really help me. Let's see, what else do I know? They've got to gain a speed of 60 meters per second before they take off. So that's actually the final speed that they need to make it up to before they take off. The airplanes are capable of being accelerated uniformly at this rate of one and a half meters per second squared. So in other words, they can they can speed up at one and a half meters per second squared. All right, so expected time to take off. Well, I know an acceleration. I know a final velocity. I know an acceleration. I know a final. Uh, it doesn't tell me anything about my initial velocity. But what do we know about planes? Right, they've got to they've got to start from somewhere. Generally, they're going to be stopped, right? In order for cargo to be able to make it onto a plane, that's a plane, by the way. That's a terrible plane, even for me. But uh, in order for cargo to make it onto the plane, it's got to be at rest. Um, so we can assume, even though the problem doesn't tell us, that we start at an initial velocity of zero meters per second. Go ahead, laugh. That's a terrible, terrible drawing. I get it. All right, so let's go ahead and solve that problem. 
you know, my final velocity has to be at least 60. An engineer would, of course, really give a lot of leeway. Um, probably instead of using 60 meters per second, they'd say, let's actually let's go up to 100 uh, just to make sure that, make darn sure that this is, our math is correct, or that our runway is long enough. Our initial velocity we know, and it's capably, capable of being accelerated at 1.5 meters per second squared. All right, so I'm left with 60 equals 1.5 times t. 60 divided by 15 would give me 4. So since this is 60 divided by 1.5, we're just going to move our decimal one place over to where we would come out with our time is 40 seconds. And that's a good way to be able to sort of estimate, or actually in this case it's not an estimation, it's an exact answer, being able to do this um, math without a, without a calculator. All right, so let's see, now that we know that it's going to take 40 seconds for this plane to take off, well, how long does the, the runway have to be? Well, how long would tell me that I am dealing with a, a displacement or a distance here? So we'll go with that second formula. And I know so far it's been like, okay, we're using this first formula and then we're using the second formula. And it just seems like that's always gonna that's always gonna work out. Um, but it just so happens that it does work out for, for these three problems. So it's not always like a step one, use V final formula. Step two, go with displacement. Um, it just so happens that it's working out this way here. So I don't know my minimum runway length. That's what I need to figure out careful because it does tell us that we've got this velocity of 60 meters per second but it's very specific that this is a final velocity so our initial velocity remember even though it doesn't tell us we know that the plane has to start from rest so that's going to be zero um, I can actually cross that off because zero times any time doesn't matter what my time is is going to be zero in the end so the first part of the formula is going to weed itself out and again if that kind of freaks you out you can put it in like I did um, our acceleration we already know was 1.5 meters per second squared and our time was 40 squared because that's part of the formula so I end up with distance equals 0 times 40 would be 0 so that doesn't really help to put that in there this 40 squared would be 1600 half of 1.5 would be 0.75 so I actually don't even need the calculator at this point. I would get in the habit of practicing as much mental math as possible. This becomes what's three quarters of 1,600. What's three quarters of 16? Three quarters of 16 would be 12, but it's not 16, it's 1,600. So we've got to keep that 100 on there. So 1,200 meters. And of course, you could plug it into your calculator, and you'd find out that um, we, are, we are, in fact, correct. All right. So final problem here. We've got this package that's being dropped out of the trap door of a plane. The package takes 3.25 seconds to hit the ground. That's my time. Um, how high up was the plane if it accelerated toward the ground at negative 9 meters per second squared? So in this case, um, we know what that negative means. So let's take a look at this plane here, which looks, I don't know, like a turd in the sky or something like that. Yeah, I just said that. But um, we want to figure out how high up this plane was. So it's in the sky already, and this package is being dropped. So it's going downwards. Think about what we know about dropping things. Uh, to begin with, this package is in the plane. How fast is it going downwards? That's something that's a little difficult because this plane has some sort of speed in the forwards direction, but this object has some sort of speed in the forward direction as well, as well as the downwards direction. To begin with, if the package is in the plane and the plane's not going down, the package is going zero meters per second in the downwards direction, which is kind of difficult to, to understand at first, but we have to break up motion into components, x, y components, just like on a graph. So x would mean how much velocity is happening in the horizontal direction and y components would mean how much uh, 
velocity is happening in the in the up and down direction or the vertical direction. So to begin with, our package, since we're looking at just dropping, we're looking at vertical motion, we would say that our initial velocity while the package is inside the plane is zero meters per second. But again, that's very specific to zero meters per second in the downwards direction, because if I haven't dropped it yet, it's not going down yet. So the only way that I can represent not going down would be to say, well, zero in the downwards direction. So I could set up, if I needed to know motion in two directions, I would have to set up some formulas for my y or my vertical direction. I would have to set up some formulas for my x or my horizontal direction. In this case, it's only dealing with how high up was this was this plane so we only care about the up and down direction which is why this is a one dimensional motion problem because um, I only care about the up and down dimension all right we know that the plane is or that not the plane sorry the package is taking 3.25 seconds to hit the ground It'd be morbid if the plane was um, and we know that it is being accelerated at a rate of negative 9 meters per second squared so how high was it? Well, that's what I don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out here. So just like I said in the, in the former problem here, um, it's not always that we're going to start with the one formula, the first one, and then we're going to go to the second one. In this case, it actually looks like we're looking for how high to begin with. So we're actually going to start with the displacement formula. Little uh, surprise ending there, like an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Just know who he is. It might have been before your time. Six cents, that sort of stuff. Crazy dude. All right, the initial velocity in the y direction was zero. Again, because to begin with, if somebody's holding the, the package in the plane, the package is not going in the downwards direction yet. So it's starting from rest, at least vertically. Uh, the time we know, which of course, to begin with, we don't even have to write this first term in because it's going to be zero in the end. The negative 9 means that it's accelerating in the downwards direction. And my time, again, we know it. It's always going to be the same as whatever we used over here. So my total displacement will be 0 plus, oop, I almost forgot my squared over there. Let's see what this becomes. 3.25 squared. 10.56, which is very reasonable. 3 squared would be 9. 4 squared would be 16. So somewhere between 9 and 16 is reasonable. Closer to 3 than we are 4. So we should be closer to 9 than we are 16. Half of negative 9 would be negative 4.5. So I'm left with negative four and a half, sorry that decimal came out bad, very poorly, times the 10.56 leaves me with a displacement of negative 47.5 meters. So in other words, how high was the plane if, it, uh, if this package accelerated toward the ground at negative nine meters per second and took 3.25 seconds to get there? Well, it must have been 47 and a half meters up there. If it fell 47 and a half meters, then that means the plane was 47 and a half meters up there. So why is it positive? Because it's asking me how high the plane was, not how far the package dropped. So if the package dropped th this far, then the plane must be that high up. And then finally, what's the speed that the package hit the ground at? Well, in other words, what's the final speed? You know, right before when we're dealing with the speed that a package hit the ground at, we're talking about right before hitting the ground, the very split moment before. Because once it's on the ground, it's at it's at zero, or it actually probably bounces and then ends up becoming zero. But it's talking about the speed like right split second before hitting the ground, the very fastest speed that it was able to get up to. Which we know how to solve that. That's a final velocity that we're dealing with. Um, what what speed? What What's the final velocity? We know the initial. We know the acceleration rate that this package is falling at. Uh, and we know the time. So final velocity, let's solve for it. Initial was zero. Again, zero because 
to begin with it's being held on to by somebody it hasn't dropped quite yet so to represent not dropping would be zero meters per second in the downwards direction our acceleration is negative nine and my time was 3.25 seconds so when I go to solve that I'm left with negative nine times 3.25 gives me a total of negative 29.25 meters per second and that makes sense this negative represents in the downwards direction and it just so happens that the object is falling in the downwards direction so our math supports what's actually happening in the real world so hopefully you feel pretty comfortable with that. If not, please email me, remind me, whatever you got to do in order to get some help. I'm, I'm here for you. See you.